So I want to spend some time really around history and thinking about the events of history and, and alongside the, the, the words of prophecy and, and, and showing the alignment between the two. We're going to consider the Roman Empire and we're going to consider Russia. Uh, and then I'm going to do an, a, a small part around Russia on, on some future prophecy elements. It makes sense that we begin, as our title is taken from there, uh, uh, for, the, for the study, that we go to Revelation and chapter 16. This sets for me the scene of what we're going to spend our time considering. Revelation 16 and at verse 19, it says the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nation fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so we're going to consider what this great Babylon, it's what this fall of great Babylon is speaking to about. It's clearly referring to the kingdom of men, to sin. We know it from verse 13 to be divided into three parts. I saw three unclean spirits, the three parts. And those are the three parts that we're going to consider. They are linked. And we're going to consider them as, as uh, individually. And what are those three parts? They're the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Uh, and my talk is going to focus upon the dragon, the military power of Babylon, as it's spoken of. So let's establish, then, where we're going to go from. Now turn with me to Daniel and chapter 7. We're going to try and put the, the ideas that are contained in Scripture of prophecy, we're going to put Daniel together with Revelation. Uh, and we're going to see the development of these phases as we go through. We won't go to Daniel 2. We know the image uh, there on the screen very well, the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image. Uh, and we know what each of those represent. And we know that there's uh, further detail it is expounded about each of these uh, sections in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. We're not going to consider the, the first uh, the gold, the silver and the bronze, we want to focus our attention on the fourth beast. We, we want to spend our time trying to understand who and what this fourth beast is. We know it represents Rome. And the image that Daniel sees in, uh, in Daniel chapter 7 is the image depicting Rome. And that's Rome in, in, in its entirety. And we'll see that, that the further development of this image is, is what we're going to consider in Revelation. The fourth beast. Dreadful and terrible. Daniel 7 and at uh, verse 7 it says, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among, <coughs> among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And so this is the image that we are now going to delve deeper into. This is referring to Rome. So let's turn, please, to uh, Revelation. And we're going to pick up now in Revelation and uh, chapter 12, uh, the reading we had read. In Revelation 12, we read uh, of well two distinct images that are put before us in those opening verses. It says there appeared, oh, we'll, we'll come back and read it in a moment. 
But what we're going to see now is a series of um, beasts that are described to us. Each one of them is different and separate. Uh, And we're going to delve into this chapter in a bit more detail in a moment. We're going to see that the red beast is their representative in this chapter of pagan Rome. It's under the under the time of Emperor Constantine, and we'll we'll show that in a moment. We're going to go into Revelation 13, and we're going to see there's a division now between the beast of the sea and the dragon. And we're going to see that there is a distinct division that is split between the west, the beast of the sea. We then have the images of the beast of the earth, the image of the beast, the scarlet beast and the false prophet. And so this part, this western empire, is going to go through a series of stages and changes. And that's what Brother Bernard is going to pick up in the second talk. I want to spend my time focusing upon the eastern empire, the dragon. It's depicted there differently as an Eastern Empire as having one head. It's described as having seven heads in chapter 12, but in chapter 13, it talks of just the dragon. There's no description of multiple heads. Uh, And that's the part that I want to focus upon. So let's understand what Revelation 12 is talking about. Apologies for the picture a little bit. Hopefully it's clear enough. Um, It was about trying to put... I find it easier to think in pictures. So for me, I had to have an image to try and understand what is being spoken about in this chapter 12. Let's just read the first few verses. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So what is this image describing? I'm going to break it down into two pictures, the picture of the woman and the picture of the dragon. Let's consider the dragon part first. Well, it talks about a war in heaven. Verse 7 tells us that this There can't be a war in the literal heavens. This is speaking of a political heaven. Michael here is is the Emperor Constantine. And this is a political war that we're talking about. It is not a a war in the literal heavens. If you look at the way some of these things are described, uh, the woman fleeing, the the dragon trying to, uh, to devour the child, this is not... Uh, a literal, this is a prophecy, this is to, for us to interpret. Notice what the dragon has. It has ten horns. Ten horns throughout scripture always refer to the same thing. Ten horns on the beast of Daniel 7. Same of the beast of the sea in Revelation 13, the scarlet beast in Revelation 17. All of them refer to Rome. Ten horns is always about Rome and the Roman Empire. So this dragon has to be about Rome. It's the same image as Daniel 10. The ten horns link it through for us. It's also got seven heads. Why has it got seven heads? Well, the seven heads of the dragon, if we, if we look at into history, and, we, uh, and I've used... Um, the historian Titus Livius, or Livy, uh, and Tacitus, uh, who were Roman historians writing at, the, uh, at this sort of time. Uh, and they break down the, uh, the Roman Empire into seven distinct divisions. The seven heads. Now to start with, Rome was formed in, in a normal way as a, of a kingdom. It had a king, a ruler. And that's called the regal head. 
And the problem with kings is they tend to be quite dominant and they tend to insist on money being given to, to them through fund wars that maybe not everybody agrees with. So it, it, the next stage was that the kings were replaced with consuls, and consuls were two. So you've got two people now that are going to uh, agree or, 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 or are more balanced, is, is the idea. The problem is this is a time of war and trouble. Uh, and what Rome struggled with is if you've got two, two consuls who can't agree on the battle plans, well, that's not really very good for battle, is it? You need to have an agreement. So the the next stage was that they had a dictatorial head, and they applied a dictator. Now, that's very good. In Roman law, the way that the dictator was put in place was a dictator was to be a dictator for one year to hopefully solve the problem of the war. Problem is, a dictator in the very name, means he wasn't very good at stepping down at the end of the year. He was a dictator after all. Why, why would he step aside to go back to what was there before? And then we had what's called the decim viral. This was a council of ten. Ten magistrates that, that sat as a council that, that led the country. And most famous for putting together the, the laws of the twelve tables. And these were set up so that the citizens could read of the, of the rules and the laws. But due to disagreement, the ten stood down and resigned, and three heads were appointed to govern. This was known as the tribunal. And so those were the first five heads. Revelation, we know, was written around about AD 96. I haven't put the, the, the times, but the imperial head was in power at the time. It starts in BC 27 and continues until the fall of Rome in AD 476. It was set up with the first emperor, Augustus Caesar, in BC 27. Now the seven-headed dragon is only concerned with the time of Rome. If you turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 17, we can show in a little bit more detail some of this. <coughs> Revelation 17, list of all verse 10, it's on the screen there. It says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. That's the detail given about Rome. Five have fallen. Written in AD 96, exactly right. The sixth head was on the throne at the time. It was the imperial head that was there. Five have fallen. One is and one to come. Not only that, it was going to rule for a short space. And we know that the Gothic or the barbarian rule over the nation or, or over the city of Rome was only between... Uh, for, for 60 years, from AD 476, and we'll, we'll come on to look at that in a moment. Verse 9, though, gives us something else. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And seven mountains, well, Rome is famous for being based upon seven hills. The Quernal, the Vinal, the Esquiline, the Calen, the Aventine, the Palatine, and the Capitoline Hills. Rome is based on seven hills, seven heads. So we see that the detail that scripture contains for us is pointing us in the right direction. Let's come back to that image in Revelation 12. So we've established that this um, dragon that is being spoken of in this image with seven heads and, and ten horns is Rome. And what's he doing? Well, let's consider the woman. What is the woman? The woman, is, uh, let's read it, and there appeared a great wonder, verse 1, in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she's with child, travailing in birth, pain to be a delivered. Pain to be delivered, sorry. Well, in scripture, the woman is a symbol of a religious system. And if we look at verse 10, it's speaking of the power of, of, of Christ. So it's a 
Christian religious system. She stood on the moon. The moon represents paganism. All emperors, until this point in time, had been pagan. They worshipped Jupiter, the moon. And they associated gods and idols with that. And this woman is going to stand upon them, to trample them, to stand over them, to be above them. And she's going to be clothed with the sun. So what's the sun talking about? Well, the sun is is the idea of power. So this Christian woman, religious system, is to have the power of the sun, so the power of the emperor. It's going to be governmental support for this religious system. She gives birth to a child, and that child is Constantine. And we can see that, and if we look at our Roman history, we'll see that up until the time of Emperor Constantine, the Roman system was pagan. And at the birth of Constantine, when he came to the throne, he changed the religious system of Rome to Christian. And it became a Christian Roman Empire. And what did Emperor Constantine do? Well, Emperor Constantine was um, ruler between 306 and 337. And in 313, he issued what's known as the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan was an agreement that the persecution of Christians would end. And it was an edict that would allow Christian worship to take place within the Roman Empire. It had been persecuted until this time. This empire had been known for paganism. And it is now, under Constantine, going to switch to being an accepting of Christianity. The other thing that Emperor Constantine did is that, well, he wanted a change. He didn't, he didn't like Rome. He felt that he should uh, set out for himself a, a something that would... would um, make him unique, if you like, and make his rule remembered. And at the time, most of the battles of Rome were taking part on the Eastern Front. And it's a huge journey from the uh, centre of Rome to, to control the battles taking part on the Eastern Front. So he set about moving the seat of power from Rome to Constantinople, or Istanbul as, as it is known today. And and he identified the city of Byzantine as a suitable place to be based. And he started, well, there was a city there, and he started uh, making it his city in uh, the year 324. And in the year 330, moved to that city and based the governmental power of Roman Empire in Constantinople. So now we're beginning to get a split. We're beginning to see a division in the Roman Empire. Now it was uh, a a few years later under the Emperor Theodosius who split the empire uh, by the the decision to to hold it um, uh, two uh, separate ruling parties effectively. Ended up with uh, battles between the East and the West. Uh, The reason Emperor Theodosius, uh, or one of the reasons, is he had two sons, uh, Honorus, who he appointed to rule the Western Roman Empire, and Arcadius, who began to rule the Eastern Roman Empire. Actually, Arcadius was officially the first emperor of the Byzantine, or the Eastern Roman Empire. And he established Constantinople as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now when Constantine set about logistically where he should build his city, it wasn't by chance that he chose Constantinople. Yes, it was a fabulously well-defended city with water on three sides. He actually set about building it because he could mirror the parts of Rome that he wanted. 
marked there are these seven hills of Constantinople. The city uh, was built upon the seven hills. And you can see how well and how easy it would be to defend this city. And and it was a uh, a fantastically well-defended city uh, over the years. So we've established that the Roman Empire has now split. There is an Eastern and a Western Empire. Now let's come to Revelation and chapter 13. We're going to read the first few verses and we're going to focus just on uh, on a couple of points here. It says, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So notice that this beast that's being described here has his power given to him by the dragon. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so we've got two distinct things here. This is a further development of the the empire. The beast of the sea is talking about uh, the, the Western Roman Empire. And the dragon is the one that gave him his power. And there are now two distinct differences. They're worshipping the beast of the sea and they're worshipping the dragon. Two very distinct powers. The power resides in the Eastern Empire and it resides with the dragon. It gives the power to the beast of the sea, the Rome, the Western Rome and the papal system. And we know from history that's exactly what happened. (coughs) The Western Roman Empire fell in the year 476. As we've said, the Gothic part, the the, the Ten Horns, the barbarians, took over the, the seat of rule in Rome. And in Constantinople, this gentleman, Justinian, came to power. Justinian the Great, Justinian the First. He came to the throne in the year 527. And he set about being a Christian power. One God, one empire, one religion. That was his motto. That's what he wanted to do. He gave the destruction of the Goths, removing them from Rome. He used his um, uh, general Belisarius, who took back Rome. And he's responsible for the extension of the Eastern Roman Empire. When he took over the Eastern Rome, he expanded it during his reign to take over a number of the Western. So here the power is clearly residing in the Eastern Roman Empire. And that is what was described as the dragon. The beast, or the, sorry, the dragon with one head that has the power and, and uh, was moving back and taking over parts of the Western uh, Roman Empire. To celebrate his successes and his power, the Emperor Justinian built uh, the church Hagia Sophia, uh, a remarkable structure that was built in just five years. It was and remained the largest building and the largest church for uh, uh, nearly a thousand years. And what he said on the construction of that, Solomon, I have surpassed you. And the name Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom. He dedicated this church to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're firmly showing the link between the Eastern Roman and the Orthodox, or the church, the Orthodox church and the state. And as emperor... He had absolute power over both elements. 
the absolute power of Justinian and the emperors of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire was that they dictated everything. They, they, they gave the law, they controlled the church and they controlled the military, they controlled everything. This single dragon head. Now that continued residing in Constantinople the Byzantine or the Eastern uh, Roman Empire continued for nearly 1100 years now there were many battles but we saw the shape of the city and how, how well it was to defend this was the, the wall that greeted uh, those uh, coming against Constantinople it remained Constantinople till the year 1453 it finally fell to the Ottomans on the, or the Ottoman Turks on the 24th of May in 1453 to a man called Mohammed the Conqueror and that bought Muslim rule into Constantinople uh, and actually Hagia Sophia was actually com- converted to a mosque it remained a mosque until 1930 it's actually um, still there today and it is a museum it was converted to a museum in 1935 so is that the end of the dragon power we've seen the destruction of the eastern Roman empire the Byzantine empire the Constantinople is now in the hands of the Ottomans what of the dragon power what of has continued with that Well, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. (coughs) Revelation 16, verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. So the dragon power is still there, even though the the Euphrates is, well, the Ottoman power is being depicted here as the Euphrates. The, The water thereof is going to be dried up, it's going to be a gradual process. But the dragon power has to continue. It's what it's telling us in verse 13, that the dragon power is still there after this. So where has the dragon power moved to? It's got to have moved. It cannot have stayed under the Ottoman rule in Constantinople. Well, there's, there's two, two parts to this move. Now, the first part is under Vladimir the Great. He was the Grand Prince of Kiev. He was the ruler over what's known as Kievan Rus, or or the uh, the Rus power, which is Russia. He was a pagan, and uh, he initially persecuted Christians in in the Kiev, which is um, northern Ukraine, uh, as we know it today. But following an incident, he decided that he needed to understand more about the religion in the nations round about him. And he sent out a series of envoys to understand the religions of the time. So he went to understand the Muslim, the, the Jewish, the Catholic and the Orthodox. That, that quote there at the bottom is the quote that these um, envoys came back after visiting Constantinople and Hagia Sophia in the year 10, uh, between 980 and 1015. I believe it's in the year about 987. They said, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. We only know that God dwells there among the people and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations. And that report affected Vladimir the Great. So much so that in 988 he sought to marry the sister of the Eastern Roman ruler, at that time Basil II. And the, his sister was named Anna, Porphogenita. Porphogenita means that she was born a royal in the purple room. So she was of the royal descendants. And he sought to marry. Well, this was almost unheard of, a, a, a um, 
pagan um, northern king wanting to marry a Byzantine Roman um, uh, princess. Well, he was so determined, he converted to Christianity so that he could marry Anna. And he returns to Kiev and he starts a program of church building and destruction of the pagan idols. He established the Orthodox Christianity in Russia. And he moved the seat of rule in 30, well, not him, but his descendants, a bit wrong in 300 years later, um, his descendants uh, uh, under the uh, battles moved the seat of rule of the Orthodox system to Moscow in the year 1325. So we have Orthodox Christianity based in Russia. Next we have Ivan the Great. We, we've jumped forward now to the time of the, uh, of, of the fall of the, um, just after the fall of the Byzantine Empire to the Ottomans. And we're under the time of the Russian ruler Ivan the Great. And he reigned between 462 to 1505. He was described as the Grand Prince. That was his title of Moscow. And he married a, um, or Grand Prince of Moscow and the Grand Prince of All Rush was his full title. And he set about at the fall of the Byzantine Empire claiming the rightful heirship to that empire. He claimed it through inheritance. He had married Sophia Paleolog, the niece of the uh, Emperor uh, Constantine XI, who was the last emperor of the Byzantine Empire. And he laid claim to the titles through this inheritance. And so this is where the dragon is residing currently, the dragon power residing through these links in the uh, area of Russia. There was a Russian monk who uh, lived at the same uh, area of time called Philotheus of, of Puskov, or Philophy. And he wrote in 1510 to the Grand Duke <coughs> Vasily. And the Grand Duke is the son of Ivan the Great. He said, two Romes have fallen. The third stands that there will be no fourth. No one shall replace your Christian Sardom. And he's right, wasn't he? we know that no one was going to replace this kingdom of men. This was going to continue until it would rise up as per the image of Daniel in, in Nebuchadnezzar's image in, in Daniel chapter 2. And it was going to be crushed by the armies of God. Russia has seen and appointed herself as the heir to the Roman throne. Laying claim through marriage into the royal line and through the, uh, orth through the Orthodox Church and the inheritance of the Orthodox Church. Let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. Actually, Moscow is built on seven hills as well. I won't attempt to read the hills, but there are seven hills of Moscow, same as Constantinople, same as Rome. If you want more evidence that, that Russia uh, and the links to the Byzantine Empire, let's just look at the imagery that Russia uses. Uh, we can go back. The, the one on the, uh, the right as you look at it is the current uh, since uh, the year 2000 coat of arms of Russia. The one on the left is the Byzantine coat of arms. It was only used in the last few years of the Byzantine Empire. Russia took that as part of its link to the Byzantine Empire. Ivan the Great used it for his royal seal. And the eagle, that symbol, the double-headed eagle, was brought back to Russia by President Putin in his first rule as president. He brought it into law in 2000. It was a very early law that he made a change to. Russia's claim as the dragon is there in, in the icon, icon, the icons, i give up the rest of it, the icons of the, uh, that are being used, linking them back to the Byzantine Empire. But under Russian rule, 
we saw the fall of the Russian Tsars. That happened in, uh, just after 1917, and it became a Soviet communist state in 1922. And as part of being a communist state, they would not acknowledge any religion. Atheism was the state view during the communist era. But remember, from Revelation 16, we expect them to be the military part of it. Uh, and under Russian, uh, under Soviet, the military power was what developed in Russia. We saw the development of them as a military might, a military power under the Cold War years. However, in 1991, we saw a change again in Russia. Under the rule of Gorbachev, we had the nation of Russia formed, and Boris Yeltsin became its first president. In 1990, under Gorbachev, he had allowed religious freedom back into the nation. In 1997, a law was signed by Boris Yeltsin that effectively enshrined in law that the Russian Orthodox religion is the preeminent religion in Russia. This newfound religious freedom, and it's signed into law. Now we come to the current president of Russia in his, what's effectively the third term. Now, Due to the law changes, he could continue in power if he's re-elected in 2018 up until the year 2024. Uh, And what sets Putin apart in the world at the moment is that he's regularly seen in church as a huge supporter of the Russian Orthodox system. There's been a massive rebuilding of the relationship between the church and the state uh, with uh, Patriarch, Patriarch Kirill and Putin. And actually, Putin's been assisting the Russian Orthodox Church. Earlier this year, on the 10th of July, enacted on the 20th of July, Russia don't mess about when they enact laws, do they? Ten days. There was a law passed restricting all religious speech to churches and places of worship. Just to put that in context, what Russia has done, if, as a group of Christadelphians in Russia, if we wanted to have a meeting in a home... Under terror laws, that wouldn't be allowed. There has to be an official, recognised place of worship. Biggest single version of that is the Orthodox um, Church. So in effect, in this law, he has supported the Orthodox Church in Russia. This was uh, a commentary that was made about that. Uh, On the 10th of July, it said, Russian President Putin signed legislation this week that severely restricts freedom of religion by prohibiting any religious speech or evangelization outside of places of worship. This new situation resembles the Soviet Union in 29. At that time, confessions of faith was permitted only in church. And that is exactly what has happened. You can't preach because it's considered terror in Russia. But in this, Putin has effectively put support to the Russian Orthodox system. Now, as the dragon, we would expect, if if Putin is to be the the dragon, go, king of the north, we'll we'll look at those in a moment, he's got to start acting like an emperor. Well, actually, some of his people, the Cossacks, do see him as an emperor. At the end of the Crimean War, they built this statue and unveiled it just outside St. Petersburg to support his annexation of Crimea, they saw him as a powerful emperor. But as an emperor, he needs to have this authority over the church, which he doesn't have. He's supporting it, but he's not above it. But a Russian president is very different to an American president. As a Russian president, his powers are far wider. He has complete authority on the decisions on foreign policy. He doesn't need the state approval. America, to do something, needs the approval of the Senate. Uh, We need the approval of the House of Lords in the UK. In foreign policy, the Duma, the the equivalent in um, Russia, isn't needed. It's one man that can make that decision, and that's Putin. 
as the commander-in-chief of the military, he can make the decisions on what they do. Now, he may not be acting in all the ways we would expect of an emperor, but he's certainly moving in that direction. Let's come back to the military angle. This is a, a, a document um, from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and this is based on the 2015. Now, we've seen uh, on our TVs and uh, etc. that Russia is rebuilding its military power under Putin and, and reinstituting the, the victory parades to show the military might that they have. And I, and I thought I'd try and put that in context to you. So this is the spend, the GDP, against GDP. Is it the actual total numbers, it, well, in some ways, are irrelevant. It's how much you spend as a proportion of your, of your, your state um, income. And Russia is spending more. It's actually spending around about the same amount as Israel spends as a percentage of its GDP. It's putting massive investment back into its military. And all of that's happening under Putin. In Revelation 16 and verse 12, we've already looked at it. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And we said, it's not speaking of, a, of the wrath being poured out upon water, it's the association of that region. So we know that that's uh, speaking of the, of the Ottoman Empire. It's going to be dried up, as we've said, it's a gradual decline. And actually, we're, we, we've seen that, haven't we? We've witnessed that over the last hundred years, the, the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Yet from Scripture, we can see that the dragon power will only be fully established when it's based back in, in Constantinople. Daniel uh, 11 with me back please, back to Daniel 11 let's just have a, a look at that Daniel 11 and verse 36 it says and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is detriment to be determined shall be done I won't go through, but verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, shall enter into the countries and shall overthrow and pass over. So verse 40 is a step change from the previous verses. This is the, the verses 36 through to 39 is speaking about Constantine. It's the change of the Roman Empire from pagan to Christian, as we've already considered. But verse 40, at the time of the end, is future. This is the dragon, the king of the north, taking over the kingdom of the Seleucids, the area of the Euphrates, the Ottoman Empire, and entering into the area of Constantinople. And we're beginning to see those links. We're beginning to see Russia in, in a number of areas pushing the uh, Turkish authorities. And this is just one example from 2015. They've asked the Turks to return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Church. Uh, but this has created huge uprising in the... Um, it, in Turkey itself, so much so that there's a um, petition gone out with over 15 million signatures that they might return the Hagia Sophia to being a mosque. Now the Ottoman Turks are not dried up just yet. Uh, and this claim upon Hagia Sophia <laughs> is beginning to build tension. It gives Putin a problem. Putin has spent the last few years of his presidency positioning himself 
as a Christian. And he's actually positioned himself as a defender of the Christian faith. Metropolitan Hilarion is a a foreign relation chief of the Russian Orthodox Church. He asked Putin to make protection and defence of Christianity around the globe a major part of his foreign policy. Bear in mind, remember, Putin has complete authority over the foreign policy. It was reported by Interfax that the reply from Putin was, you needn't have any doubt that that's the way it will be. So he assured, it assured Metropolitan Hilarion that Russian foreign policy would defend Christians from persecution abroad. Now is that one of the reasons that he's in Syria? Possibly. What else do we expect of the dragon or Gogian power? Uh, we're running out of time. So uh, Ezekiel 38 verse 4, we'll read it quickly. It says, I will turn thee back, put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with buckler shields, all of them handling swords. Now we, we know from the earlier verses in Ezekiel, and I'm sure we appreciate that this is speaking of um, <coughs> Russia, the um, Prince of Rus, the Chief Prince of Meshach or Moscow, uh, it was the title of the historic rulers uh, of, of the time, talks about being putting hooks in thy jaws. Now that phrase occurs, you turn with me to Ezekiel and chapter 29. Ezekiel chapter 29, and it's uh, in reference to Pharaoh. Ezekiel 29 and verse 3, it says, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his river, which hath said, my river is mine own, I have made it for myself. I will put hooks in thy jaws and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales. You see, for the um, iniquity in, uh, of Pharaoh, he was told that that great dragon, because he put um, my river, mine own, I, myself, he, he puffed up himself. It, it's speaking about the sinful nature of this man. He's going to put hooks in his jaws. And that's exactly the same phrase that is spoken of in Ezekiel 38. The hooks into the jaws. Is this speaking of the the end of this northern power, this Gogian army, in the same way as it was forebode the destruction of the Pharaoh? Let's jump forward to um, the relationship that we see of uh, of picking up the ideas of Ezekiel 38, let's jump forward to the relationship that that Russia has in the Middle East. And more specifically, let's consider the relationship that Russia has with Israel. Uh, We know that over the last, just over uh, 12 months now, that the um, relationship between Putin and Netanyahu has been developing. And a huge amount of, of military cooperation has been taking place as, the, as they try and work together in, in ensuring that they're not fighting one another in, in the area of Syria. This is an article by um, the Middle East Eye uh, and the uh, writer Yossi Mehman and the strange love affair of Putin and Netanyahu. Since August 2015, uh, Netanyahu has travelled to Moscow four times for meeting with Putin. And more than he's had with with America, who we traditionally see as the great supporter of of Israel. And there's been over ten different phone calls. And the commentator's last words were, it is hard to understand and explain this unusual, wonderful friendship. We expect from scripture that Russia, the dragon power, is going to come down into um, 
into the Middle East and into Israel. And yet, here's this friendship between the two being developed. It says in verse 11 of Ezekiel 38, Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, to take a prey. We expect this power to come against Israel. And yet this friendship seems to be contrary to what we would expect them to see. But it does lead us to say, art thou come, that that idea of surprise, art thou come to take a spoil? Is this, we see, a clever political move by Putin? You don't need to worry about the walls and the gates if you've got the key. And actually, there's a a link there. If you look at the history of how Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, they didn't destroy the the walls. They didn't get through the walls, even though they had cannons. Somebody left the gate open. And they walked in through the gate. And they destroyed them that way. And is this what we're seeing with Putin? Getting the keys to the gate. So to bring our thoughts to a conclusion... We've seen the developing phases of the dragon uh, as it's developed through the Roman Empire and, and is, has moved in the, from the Byzantine, the Eastern Roman Empire, I- into uh, residing in, within Russia. But we know to, the, to fulfil scripture, it needs to overthrow the remnant of the Ottoman power. It needs to be residing in Constantinople. And at that point, Daniel's image will be stood upon its feet. And it will herald the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fall of the kingdom of men. So when it comes to the dragon power, when it comes to Russia, let's watch carefully the moves that she makes. Let's watch carefully her relations uh, to Turkey and Istanbul. Let's watch carefully her developing relationships in the Middle East. Because for each and every one of us, this heralds an exciting time. A time that is beginning to the begin, is going to start the end and the fall of the kingdom of men, the kingdom of sin. Thank you. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. 
Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish thought for the days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time, and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter, which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation, so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.